On September 30th, 1965, some friends of mine and I were drinking cheap wine and I was angry. One of my friends, one of my gang members had been killed not too long before that. We encountered Mr. White, had no indication that he was actually from a gang. I, I thought he was, but later found out that he probably was not. And after a few words, I shot him. You know, he died probably right there on the scene. And it was just a senseless act. And I, I wish I could go back and undo it. I wish it would never have happened. And I regret it every single day. My best friend when I was incarcerated the last time just got out about almost two years ago after 52 years in, in prison. He didn't do anything any worse than I did. He ended up doing 52 years of his life in, in, in prison. When I went to become the president of the Portland Trailblazers, you know, running the Jordan brand. And one of the things that I've struggled with, the whole idea of why me? Of all the people I know, of all the folks who were, I was in and out of jail with, all the folks that I did criminal stuff with, why me to be the one that gets to move to the situation that I'm in or get to be where I am? And, and, and I think part of the reason why is to tell this story. All through elementary school, I was a uh, straight A students, teachers, pet, that, that kind of deal. And my goal was always to please teachers and parents. That lasted up until around the time I started middle school, which we called junior high back then. The guys in the street were like the cool guys. And that's what I wanted to be. At the age of 12 years old, I was uh, the first time I had an interaction with the police. A friend of mine and I stole the bike. That was the first time a policeman pulled a gun on me. I was running, trying to get away, and the cop pulled out the gun and said, stop or I'll blow your brains out. And I stopped, of course. But that kind of started my journey down the wrong path. At that point, I, I uh, started to get more and more involved in the street. I joined a gang when I was like 13. And from that point, I just started to live this this life of, of crime, basically. Even though I was 16 years old, I was charged as an adult. I uh, ended up pleading guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to four and a half to 20 years. And so I was sentenced to do my time at Camp Hill. One of the older guys while I was there talked about using the time to educate myself, to learn things. So I started reading and I got so hooked on reading that anytime I wasn't at work or doing something, I was reading a book. I mean, I read everything from classics to Westerns to science fiction to you name it, because I just developed this habit for reading. I took classes to get uh, my GED and uh, I ended up taking the GED exam. And about a week or so later, I was in my cell and the guy that who worked there who had administered the exam, he came down to my cell and he said, hey, how you doing? I said, hey. I said, the, did I pass? He said, not only did you pass, but you got one of the highest scores I've ever seen. He said, we'd like for you to be the valedictorian at the graduation ceremony this year. I'm like, man, I'm not doing that. I'm like, no, I'm too cool to do that kind of stuff, right? The reality is there were a number of people there who also were in that same thing. So we would kind of, you know, we were cool, but we were also about education and about trying to learn things. And, and I talked to some of my friends later and they were like, nah, man, you should do that. He, they were like, you should, you should do that. And I delivered the valedictorian address at the graduation. I don't remember the whole speech, but I remember my last line and it was, let's not serve time, let's let time serve us. So I did my four and a half, got out, kind of knocked around for a while, was kind of in and out of jail, still hadn't figured out what I wanted to do. I ended up back in, in jail with a number of armed robbery charges. I think I had five armed robbery charges. When I got to Greaterford Penitentiary, which is where I ended up doing that time, they had a program there where you could take college classes inside the jail and 
because Pell Grants were available, there were a number of colleges that were teaching classes inside the prison. And then they had a program there where you could qualify by taking classes, not getting into trouble. You could qualify to move into these trailers that were outside the jail wall. And you lived in those trailers and left every day to go to school, had to be back by eight o'clock at night. And when I heard about that program, I'm like, man, that's how I want to do my time. If I got due time, that's the best way to do it. The two things that got me through my last time incarcerated were religion and education. Those are the two things that made me believe that I could change my life. The sad thing is that that program doesn't exist anymore. The focus shifted from rehabilitation, it shifted to just warehousing people, to putting people in jail, and hey, if we put them in jail and throw the key away, we don't have to worry about them anymore. And I think that shift did away with a lot of beneficial programs. The one I was really interested in was, was, uh, was called Arthur Anderson at the time and spent the whole day interviewing with a number of people throughout the day. And all day I'm thinking to myself, should I share my background? You know, should I really come clean and open up about my background? And so finally I get to the last person who was like the hiring manager and I decide I'm gonna share my story. And as I was talking to him, I could see his face changing and I'm like, oh, I don't think this is going how I hoped it would go. He said, wow, that's an amazing story. He said, I'm sure you'll do great. And he reached in his pocket and pulled out an envelope. He said, but I, I had an offer letter here already to give you, but I can't give it to you now. He said, I can't take the chance on something happening down the line. So, you know, I wish you the best and I'm sure things are gonna work out for you, but I, I can't give you the letter. And at that point, I, decided that I was not gonna share my background. I wasn't gonna deny, I wasn't gonna lie if there was a question, but I wasn't gonna volunteer the information. And that's the way I approached my career for the next 40 years, basically. For all of that time, I was always nervous and anxious and afraid that, um, that it would somehow come out. I had uh, recurring nightmares about going back to jail for something that I didn't know about. I had migraines for years to the point where um, I had to end up in the ER a couple times. Through the course of that, I got to meet some of the folks at Nike. One of the people was uh, a person named Steven Gomez, who was the global head of Nike Apparel. He and I would get together like once a quarter or so, and just maybe have dinner and talk about what was going on with the business. And I remember the last time we had that dinner, I remember driving home thinking, I feel like I just got interviewed, <laughs> you know what I mean? And sure enough, a couple weeks later, Steven called and said, hey, would you have any interest in coming to work for Nike. I've been mortified, fortified, fitting like a Mordecai. I ain't regular, feel like Jordan wearing 45. Traumatized, victimized, seen some of my people die. Knock you off a base with a bat when them bitches slide. I was the first black vice president in the history of Nike when I when I started working there. I did not realize that until after I got there. Michael Jordan was about to retire from the Bulls for the last time. The formula was we design a cool shoe, we do some advertising with Spike Lee or Bugs Bunny or somebody, and then MJ wears that shoe into, you know, 82 games and into the playoffs. That was the formula to sell the shoe. And now that he's retiring, you're taking a big piece of that formula out. Well, no one had ever taken a retired athlete and said, okay, now we're gonna build a brand and now that he's retired. So there were a lot of people who felt like, hey, it was a nice run, but that, that, was, that was it. And I was then asked to put a team together and strategies on how we were gonna take that logo and actually evolve it into a brand. Phil Knight accused me of cherry picking the organization to put my team together. At the time we started, the Jordan business was about 140, $150 million. And this year is over $5 billion. So we figured out something that, that kind of worked. When I went to become the president of the Portland Trailblazers, the reason I took that job in reality was that how many times is someone who looks like me gonna have an opportunity in a job like that? 
and mainly to show young people that look like me that that they can do a job like that. That was the main reason, pretty, pretty much the reason that I took that job. The recidivism rate is about 75, 77%. People who get out and come back, you know, 77% of people who are incarcerated end up back in at some point. If people learn a trade while they're incarcerated, that 77% goes to 30%. If they get a bachelor's degree, that 77% goes to 6%. And if they get a master's degree, it goes to zero. So to me, that's a clear indication that education is a big helper in getting people to be able to change their lives and to break out of that cycle of you get arrested, you go to jail, you don't learn anything or do anything that's gonna change your mentality. You get out, you do the same thing again and you're right back in. And it's a, it's a vicious cycle. I know I was caught up in that cycle. Talent is distributed equally, but opportunity is not. Some of the most intelligent, creative, smart people I've ever met are people that I've met inside the penitentiary because their situation and their environment hasn't allowed them to really express and take advantage of that talent, that, they, that, that God-given talent that they have. And I think in a lot of cases, that is shortchanging people and it's shortchanging companies. The street experience, the jail experience, it made me more able to deal with situations that come up. You know, we have a problem with the shoe selling or something like that. And I'm like, well, I'm not in front of a judge trying to plead for my life, so we can figure this out. I think people have the perception that, you know, someone who's been incarcerated is not going to be a good employee. They maybe don't necessarily believe they can trust that person. What companies need to realize is that the people who are serious, who come out of penitentiary and are serious about changing their life and about making a contribution, you're not gonna find anybody that's more dedicated and that's gonna work harder. There are so many people who would jump at the opportunity to change their life if they really believe that it was real. I think that we need more and more opportunities like that for folks. We were fortunate enough to meet with um, some of Mr. White's family, his son, his daughter, and his sister. Once we got to that point where, you know, I was able to sit down with them and tell them how sorry I was and express my remorse for what I did and for them to accept that from me and to um, express the fact that they are willing to forgive me for it. Uh, to me, that, that, that meant the world to me. Again, I understand why people would see it as something that, that shouldn't be and couldn't be forgiven. I understand and recognize the severity of what I did. And um, again, I, I, am, I wish I could go back and undo it. I can't, but I can express the fact that, uh, you know, it's something that I live with every day and that I'm sorry for every day. Mistakes are to be learned from. You, you can't go back and undo it. Now you can just try to say, okay, how can I move forward? How can I, you know, try to make up for what I did? How can I try to get back uh, to, to offset some of what, what it was that I did? But, but again, I think that's, that's not an easy place to get to. This guy named B.J. Armstrong used to play for the Bulls when Michael Jordan was there. We talked to B.J. about MJ, about Michael Jordan, and he said, he said, Michael Jordan never lost the game. He either won or he learned.